Hi, I'm Dr. Becky, and this is Good Inside. I'm a clinical psychologist and mom of three on a mission to rethink the way we raise our children. I love translating deep thoughts about parenting into practical, actionable strategies that you can use in your home right away. One of my core beliefs is that we are all doing the best we can with the resources we have available to us in that moment. So even as we struggle, and even as we are having a hard time on the outside, we remain good inside. Hi, Anna. I am so excited and honored for you to be on the podcast today. So welcome. Well, thank you so much. I am absolutely, it's such a privilege and I am such, I honestly, your, your work and resources have transformed my parenting. So this is a wonderful thing to be chatting with you today. Well, we can mutually fangirl because I've been a fan of you for a really long time too. And I think I reached out to you on Instagram, however long ago, feeling kind of sheepish. Um, and then, you know, we ended up connecting and I just always love talking with you. Do you know what? I think it was my husband that introduced me to you. He found one oh. of your videos on Instagram and he's like, wow, this lady is talking some powerful stuff. And yeah, that was that was the beginning. So thank you. Well, that is very heartwarming. Uh, I feel like there's a way that that's going to be related to what we're talking about because I find so many of the women in heterosexual relationships that are in our community. And they often say, how do I get my partner? How do I get my husband to watch a video or be engaged? So how amazing for everyone to know also, like it is possible, yeah, for a husband to take on that labor and say, hey, look what I found. You might be interested in this parenting related video. Yeah. And I'm very glad. I'm very glad. And I I think that's it, isn't it? It's ideally having being on the same page or at least kind of seeking those resources and that insight together means that you can implement it together. And yeah, it's been a bumpy journey, but we're we're on it and we're so grateful. Our kids are grateful. Well, let me tell everyone the topic we will be talking about because it is such an important one. It's something that you and I share as just a common area of interest, of importance, of helping parents understand what's going on. And it's the topic of mother rage. And irritability. And we can also, you know, kind of a little generalize that to parental rage. Um, And here, I think we're going to be talking about maternal rage as related to kind of concepts around femininity and motherhood that have been given to us over the years. So let's just jump in. Like, what, what is mom rage? What do you hear about it from other moms? So I'll I'll share a bit of my own experience because I think I've started hearing so much more of mums like in my in my community on social media I've started hearing so many more of people's kind of behind the scenes experience since I've started sharing mine because I think there is often so much kind of shame and self-judgment around rage and anger so it's one of those things that we can feel really it's hard to talk about. It feels like yeah. a taboo. So when I started untangling it for myself with my psychotherapist head on, that's when I find that I can start removing that shame from my own experience. And then I can hopefully verbalize it and articulate it in a way that will help kind of chip away at that shame for other people so they can talk about it more openly. So I am quite a fiery person, I would say. I I, I feel things quite big, mostly like my uh, deeply feeling kid that I that I have that um, will hopefully not be so deeply feeling in the background as he's having his bath as we record. Um, so I've always felt emotions quite big, but I've learned to really kind of ooh, just contain them, and, but not not in a great way, just kind of push them down. And I I felt irritability with hormones and kind of you know that oh just you know things coming out sideways and trying to trying to push that down as well for the sake of my relationship. And I kind of coped all right with that, to be honest. I didn't like it when I saw that rage or that frustration rise. However, the pandemic gave us so fewer opportunities to do the things that distill that mm. anger. So for me, that that rage, that feeling of it's a mixture of overwhelm, stress, it's lots of things. It's kind of really bubbling and physical and quite visceral. Um, but there were less 
opportunities to do those things that kind of really diffuse that for me. So for me, it was walking over here in England. We were allowed to walk once a day and often I'd walk with my kids and they would start, someone would have a tantrum within feet of the house and then we had to go back. And that was that done. So there was no walking, you know, there wasn't really seeing friends, having that community, those little chats that us mum have was kind of leaning against someone else's washing machine in their kitchen as the chaos is continuing. You know, there were less of those opportunities, even the moments of space that you get when you walk around from the passenger seat of the car to the driver's seat of the car. And it's just that quiet. You know, there was none of those those moments. And I started realizing that I was experiencing more of this this kind of rage in a way that was so much more, again, visceral than I had experienced before. And there was this one moment and I remember it so clearly I was in the kitchen and the three kids were there. It was just hard. We hadn't been out. And I I messaged my husband who was working upstairs and I said, you've got to come and swap out with me. Like you have to, I'm going to, I'm going to pop. I said, and he didn't read the message because he was on a conference call. 20 minutes later, I'm surprised I lasted that long. It just, I popped and I roared like a lion. I screamed. I mean, I was almost bent double because it was like this, this stuff, this, this noise just came out of me and I can even feel it thinking about like remembering that moment. And it was, it was uncontained and, you know, whoever in my house wasn't crying, started crying. Like my toddler had already been crying. She was on the floor. She cried harder. One of my kids came in from the other room wondering what the hell was going on. My husband entered the room on the phone with the laptop in arms going, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to see you there. And, you know, it was, it was this moment that, that followed came the most, the biggest wave of guilt, the biggest wave of shame. And I thought I have to untangle what this is because I am not going to be the only one roaring in my kitchen right now in life. So I started to think about it and I started to realize that, you know, this this anger, this rage in me was a very clear culmination of unmet need, chronically overlooked need due to circumstance or just purely because I found it hard to ask maybe sometimes and, and unvalidated feelings that I hadn't been able to voice, that I hadn't that I hadn't spoken about. And I think in talking about that then, and once I'd kind of determined what I thought this was on social media, I started getting this huge kind of barrage of, of me too's. This is, wow, these are the moments I've been having. These are the, the feelings I have been having. And I have been shaming myself and feeling guilty. And then we just continue the cycle. And I, I didn't want to be in that place. So I have so many different directions. I'd I'd love to explore with you, but I want to actually go in none of them yet because I want to come back to something you said. Rage as a symbol or a symptom or a sign of unmet needs, Mm. not as a sign of badness, as a sign of there's something wrong with me, as a sign of what type of mom does that? Do I not really love my kids? Am I not fit to be a mom? Not that's not what you said. You said rage as a symptom of unmet needs. Can you can you unpack that term unmet needs a little bit? No, you know, yeah. And the badness is where I'd gone before because the badness is where I naturally jumped to. So this is why I really had to unpack and unpick this because I know that I am not bad. I know that I love my children. I know that I'm a good enough mom. And for me, those unmet needs were the overlooked opportunities for rest or the opportunities that I saw but didn't feel deserving of. The lack of support and the support that was there that perhaps I found difficult to ask for. Because it's like a spiral, isn't it? You know, the more we push these things away or the more we overlook them or the more we can't grab hold of them, you know, it it nudges our self-esteem down, it it affects our confidence. And then we, you know, it's so easy just to spiral down. And there there were other little symptoms of this kind of rage and irritation. And it would be... The, the gap between responding to my, like something happening, some challenging moment, I've got a deeply feeling kid, you know, one of those moments where those, his emotions just, you know, feel really unregulated and all out there. And I'm that recipient. I am that, I am that absorber. I am that container. And 
I think the not having my needs met or not meeting them, not recognizing what they are, it it lessens that gap between that trigger, that that emotion from him and how I respond. So I might then snap at him Mm -hmm. or I might say, for goodness sake, Charlie, I haven't got time for this now. When actually what I really want to come out in those moments is this considered response. But we have to have energy for that. There's a couple of things I want to kind of speak to everyone listening right now. So for everyone listening right now, I want to just ask yourself, have I had an episode or many, many, many episodes of this parental rage? Just pause and ask yourself this and hold next to your answer, especially if it's a yes, which I would guess is true for 100% of mm-hmm. the human beings I know, including myself, is I'm still a good person. And then I want you to actually just say to yourself right now, I must have important unmet needs. I must have important unmet needs. Anna is a licensed psychotherapist. So am I. Trust us when we say this is true. I must have important unmet needs. My rage is not a sign that I'm a bad parent or a bad person or that anything's wrong with me. My rage is a sign that I have unmet needs. And when I do have a whole host of unmet needs, and yes, it's normal to think, I don't even know what my needs are. You can have unmet needs even if you don't know what your needs are. Very, very common. Then Anna, what you were saying and, and I'm a very visual person. So if you're like me and you're listening and you're not driving, you know, if you're driving, do not do what I'm saying. If you can put your hands out in front of you and, you know, kind of have a gap between them and look at one hand and say, this is an urge I'm having. And look at the other hand and say, this is the actual action I'm having. And when we're in a place where we're more grounded, we can have an urge to yell at a kid. And it can be separate from the action of yelling at our kid, right? There's distance between our hands. Now, if you join me in kind of clapping your hands together, when we're in a place, and I'm curious if this is what you're saying, when we have these chronic kind of unmet needs, there's no space between urge and action. One just immediately converts into the other. So I have an urge to yell and it's just coming out as a roar. Yeah, absolutely. It's like I I liken it to, you know, when I'm really depleted, it's like my skin's gone. There's no Mm. buffer against Mm. the world. There's no, you know, the noise is louder, the stresses are more stressful, the challenges kind of are far more likely to floor me. I'm reacting to everything. My nervous system is just ready. It's wound up and ready. And And you named yourself as a deeply feeling person. And it's one of the core things I think about deeply feeling kids and adults is their porousness, right? And that's what you're saying. No skin is like just complete porousness to the world. And I think, you know, even if people don't identify as a deeply feeling kid when we're depleted, we're we're more likely to get into that place. And as for not yes. knowing what those needs are, I've been there and I I sometimes what I find it really helpful to do, also a very visual person, is I imagine standing in a shop and I'm trying on different clothes. And I'm 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 just trying to, you know, when you try things on and sometimes you try something on and it just fits and it fits and you know that it's the right fit for you. So the other day I was sitting in my car and I was like, wow, I've got a need here. I don't know what it is. So I started listing them out to myself. I'm like, am I hungry? Am I tired? Do I need a hug? Am I lonely? And that the word lonely just slotted into the core of me. And I was like, oh, I'm lonely. And I thought, right, there we go. That's the need there. And it's, I think sometimes we're so used to overlooking our needs Mm -hmm. that we don't even, we've lost the language of them for ourselves. But I love that. I love how you take away the morality around, I don't know what my needs are. Because again, it's so easy for all of us to struggle with something and immediately convert that into badness or something's wrong with me. Even like I'm trying to figure out my needs. Okay, I have some needs. And you're right. Sometimes you go into a store and you think, I do need new clothes. I don't know what I want, but I don't know exactly what I need, but I know I'm going to go try some things on. And then you try something on, you say it fits, and you're like, awesome, I found something. Most people don't say to themselves, God, what is wrong with me that I didn't know that I needed this red and pink polka dotted shirt? I should have known I was looking for this. No one says that. They just think, wow, cool. I went through a process and I found something that worked. So, uh, so empowering to think about our needs in that way. I'm just going to try things on. I don't have to know if it fits. 
and trust over time that my body will just kind of click with something. Yeah, but this is what we do with our kids, isn't it? And there's always a, you know, there's always a little us inside of us. And for some of us, that little us never really learned the value, like the value or the language for their needs, or maybe they just hit them because. So for me, there was, um, when I was young, my sister had cancer. So the, there was so much going on that I wanted to be neat and tidy and almost need less. I didn't want to add to the burden. So for me, my needs just got pushed down. I didn't really value them. I didn't really have them validated because I found it hard to talk about them. So, you know, for me, I need to go through that process. And I think as soon as we add that compassion and release that expectation of ourselves, we're less likely to get stuck because that shame and that self-judgment and that self-criticism that comes in those moments of frustration or rage or irritability because we don't like it. We don't like ourselves when we're like that. That's not, it doesn't fit with that view of how we think we should be as mums. And as soon as we release some of that shame and that judgment, we can see it for what it is. That is just a little flag that pops up and says, hey, you need something. Something's not quite right here. Are you okay? What do you need? How can we start speaking to that little version of us inside that, you know, just like I do with my kids, are you okay? Maybe they're, they're upset about something and I just want to gently find out what that is so that maybe I can can sit with them in that or or help them support them shame compassion blame curiosity i'm just thinking about these various ways we can react to those moments of that rage coming out so can you explain i know you explained this so beautifully like what what does shame and blame really do to us after those moments yeah so they just keep us stuck in that place because it's almost as if let's say there's there's a need for support or or you're going through something you've tucked it away because life is busy and fast and actually you're really sad about something that has happened and it's just pushed down and pushed down and it's an unmet need to talk an unmet fe- an undisclosed and unvalidated feeling and it just comes out and then we pile on that shame, we pile on that frustration and we kiss our kids goodnight and we think, I'm going to be better tomorrow. I'm going to try harder and we push further and we push further and we try harder and we up the pressure and then we're more like, you know, that just adds it all on. So when when we feel that guilt, it's, it's thinking actually that guilt has purpose. It's there to say, right, let's do something about this. It's not saying, because I've got many friends who will say to me, Anna, don't worry about it. Everyone shouts at their kids. I'm like, do you know what? I am worried about it because to me, it's something that I want to work on. Mm. It's not, I'll say, I might even say to my, to my kids, you know, I'm really sorry that my emotions came out like that. I'm really sorry that I did shouting. And they might say, it's okay, mommy. I'm like, actually, do you know what? It's not how, it's not how I ideally want to be. It's not how I want to talk sometimes. So I, I'm tired and I'm grumpy and I'm going to work on that. Mm. You know, so actually it's it's taking, it's being accountable and it's taking responsibility and it's thinking, where would you like to be? And, and I would say it's not all of the time, but more of the time. So as we work on these things, we have to have compassion and grace for ourselves because we're not perfect. And as we know, children don't need a perfect parent to prepare them for a very imperfect world. So it's it's recognizing that when that guilt is there, it's there to prompt us, mm. not to shame us. We can slip into that shame. I am bad. I am wrong. I am not good enough. Or we can go into that, let guilt prompt us to think, right, what's going on here? How can I resource myself? What can I do? What can I read? What can I listen to? Which of Dr. Becky's podcasts <laughs> might be helpful right now? You know, and it's meeting, it's meeting that need because we want to do well. We don't need to do perfectly, but we want we want to do well. So it's letting that guilt prompt you has a purpose. We don't need to fear it. It's just horrible when it turns into that shame and we do not need that because then we're stuck in it. We're stuck. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I, I think about it so similarly, maybe with slightly different language, right? That I agree. Guilt, guilt is a really helpful emotion. I always think guilt reminds me what my values are. Like I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm happy that something reminds me of my values when I'm in a bad place. It helps me reorient. And I think how guilt, for everyone listening, how I think about guilt is different from shame. Guilt allows me to see my behavior as not in line with my values while holding kind of who I am as a person as separate from my behavior. Essentially, I'm a good person who did a not so good thing. 
My behavior was the yelling, not so good, not in line with my values. My personhood, my identity remains good. I am good inside. To me, shame is very different in that we use some behavior to essentially define and take over our personhood. So yeah, I I still yelled. That's still not great in either scenario, guilt or shame. But in shame, what happens is essentially my behavior collapses into my identity. I am bad because I did a bad thing. And so there's there's no quick and easy way, you know, to uh to cope with with that difference. But I do think that's like a little bit of a shorthand when you're in that spiral. That's probably shame and not guilt. And just to almost hold your hands out and say, "Here I am as a person. I'm a good person." And look that way. And then look the other way, the other hand and say, "Here's that thing I did. Yep, that was not so good." And and I find that useful. I'm a good person, and I look the other way who did not such a good thing. And the only way we can cope and move forward is from a place of feeling good inside. Because as long as you feel bad inside, your entire energy has to go into kind of surviving that feeling. There's no growth there. There's no growth in survival mode, right? Finding that goodness, reminding yourself, I'm still a good person. I always say to parents, because they say the same thing, well, am I going to let my kid off the hook, right? You're not letting anyone off the hook. I always think you're keeping someone on the hook. If you actually want to help someone change, if you want them to be responsible for change, you have to hold your own goodness or that person's goodness. If you want to let them off the hook, blame and shame and punish away. Punish yourself, punish your kid. That's actually a way you let someone off the hook because it's impossible to change. Yeah, so true. And I think a good way to determine whether you're feeling guilt or shame is to think, are you moving towards the thing, the resource, the support? Mm that is going to help you or are you actually moving away? Because Mm. what's the point? I'm going to fail anyway. I'm just a terrible person. My kids deserve more than this. And then we're just swimming around in it and we're less likely to do the thing, whether it's rest or have that conversation because we're so embarrassed about it. You know, it's our, is it moving you towards that thing or is it moving you away? I love all these images that we're we're working with. I love an image. So, I want to move to, I know a question probably on many people's mind. What can I do proactively, you know, to have fewer of these moments, to have less rage build up and then kind of come out when everything's overflowing? Um, Because that's, I think that's what's better for everyone involved. Yeah. And I think it's really just starting to notice and ask yourself, I just use these two little questions. What do I feel? What do I need? You know, we check in with our kids often, don't we? We monitor them. We just kind of give, we just glance at them, make sure that they're okay, make sure that they're not kind of looking really hungry or really sleepy or, you know, kind of starting a fight with one another. And we just kind of, we just, we're just aware. And I think when we notice ourselves checking in with our kids, what would it be like just to say to yourself, feeling need, feeling need? What do I feel? What do I need? Might be nothing. Or it might be like, oh, I'm just feeling really hormonal and I really need a wee. Mm. You know, just starting to become sensitive and aware of what those needs are, even if you can't meet them then, just even acknowledging it, naming it, noticing it is validating. It's saying I matter so that, you know, sometimes we don't realize that, that we're at that place before we just hit the crash. You know, something happens, the cereal box falls out the cupboard and we're a mess Yes, because we haven't noticed that actually we've been overlooking these things so chronically. And then we shame ourselves because we're like, oh my goodness, why am I so upset about this? You know, sometimes it is that straw that breaks the camel's back that finds us on the floor on a Wednesday afternoon, you know, having viscerally roared like a lion because I can't even remember what the trigger was at that moment, but it would have been something small. Yep. But actually, it, you know, and it's seeing, it's looking behind and thinking, instead of being cross with myself for what just happened that seemed so insignificant, what about looking back and thinking, what contributed to that? What needs am I overlooking? How can I start just making space for them in normal life, day-to-day life? Because the more we give, the more we need. It's simple science, mm-hmm. isn't it? You know, we know that when it comes to our car, we put the fuel in. The longer we drive, the more fuel we need. Yet with ourselves, I think... You know, we just look for all the hacks, the coffee, the any way to kind of shortcut meeting a need so that we can just subdue it and silence it and tuck it away. And these things just build. 
they just become more urgent. I think that's really powerful, that idea of shortcuts. I'm, I'm not going to remember, right? I don't remember where I read this, but someone said like, you know, there's always two problems with shortcuts. You get somewhere unprepared, right? Or you get somewhere before you're supposed to be there. And it's interesting, right? With self-care, like is a shortcut to self-care, right? Having a cup of coffee. Well, it might not be. You might actually need more time than that. You might need to do something different. And you know, I think another piece that we, you know, haven't gotten to yet is this this is so much bigger than any one of us in terms of our, you know, pattern of not listening to or getting to know or meeting our own needs. Right? We are up also against this, you know, huge, you know, societal construct around motherhood as such selflessness. It's always a term that I find terrifying the idea of a mother as selfless or father or any parent as selfless. Like, you know, I always think about a parent as like the leader of a family or the CEO. I just don't know anyone who wants a selfless CEO of anything. Like you want someone to be without a self. That's actually like the most terrifying image. Yeah. Well, when you strip it back like that, you know, I think we think about it as giving and loving and you know, I started motherhood thinking that to love, and this is the the narrative that I, I learned as a child, that to love is to give yourself away without question, without, you know, without really sharing the cost. And, and I think, you know, our kids need us to have a self because that is how that they, they learn, you know, is it that all of these emotions stop when you become a mom, the rage, the boredom, the frustration, the apathy, the, you know, all of those feelings, do they just stop when we become mums? Because sometimes I feel like that's that's the pressure that we place upon ourselves is that when we have a baby, we lose half the spectrum of human emotion and we feel cross with ourselves when we feel anything other than that caricature ideal of nurturing and loving and sacrificial. Mm-hmm. You know, we give ourselves away and then what have we got left? And And I think, you know, it can be pretty practical sometimes. And to me, like the idea of motherhood as selflessness or self-sacrificial, I can just say for me, does not serve me. That idea does not serve me, period. That to me as an adult is enough to rally around something different. It sounds like it doesn't really serve you either. No, gosh, no. And it doesn't serve my kids and it doesn't serve my family and it doesn't serve my friendships. And I think this is what I started to realize when, so my second, uh, my lovely deeply feeling kid had silent reflux and it went undiagnosed for the first kind of six months of his life so he screamed and screamed and it was awful and I I tried and I tried and I tried to to fix the world and I couldn't and I had less and less resources and I remember just feeling like an utter I felt like I was bad inside I felt like if I was good inside I would have been able to be enough for my child so I kind of almost took and absorbed all of the blame and the pain and the, the the difficultness about that situation. And I remember, you know, thinking I have pushed on and pushed on and pushed on because I felt this is what I should do as a good mum. And then I started to realize I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. I was, you know, it wasn't just that the situation was difficult. It was just that I had nothing left of myself. I didn't even have a sense of humor anymore because we need energy to laugh. We need energy to rationalize anxious thoughts. We need energy to coach ourselves through moments where we feel tempted to compare the living daylights out of ourselves against what we see on social media. We need energy to engage in other people, to invest in relationships. And I think I'd seen this giving of myself away as love when actually the, in reality, uh, chronically, it stopped me being able to truly give and receive love in a way that made life fulfilling, in a way that it should be. So I would love to end with kind of taking some of this and turning it into some kind of really practical in the moment kind of strategies, because I know people listening are thinking, okay, yes, probably that idea of motherhood or fatherhood as self-sacrifice, that doesn't serve me either. And, And just saying that out loud is so powerful. It takes away judgment, just whether an idea serves you or not. Does that serve me? It does not serve me. If we go with that, And I think putting that into action involves these moments of like, how do I actually carve out time for myself? What do I say to myself to motivate doing that? And what do I say maybe to my kids, essentially, in those moments? And I would love, Anna, for you to go first. And 
it could be on something different, but I love a reel you have about, and it involves you swimming. Yeah. Can you speak about that and maybe relate that to in a moment that you are choosing to say go swimming as an act of fulfilling a need you have? What do you say to yourself to convince yourself this is important? And what might you say to a kid who, let's be honest, is at the door saying, no, or can I come with you? Right? Yeah. So you know what? That was transformational for me, this realization that in in doing these things to fill myself up, I was loving my children. I was literally equipping myself to be able to respond and react more lovingly to them. I was widening that gap between that reaction, that immediate, whatever it was, the sniping remark or the shout. I was widening that gap between what I sometimes felt like doing because I'm human and I have a reaction and a nervous system response to something. And sometimes I just want to run out of the house, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm far less likely to do that when I've had some breathing space, some time, some little something that invests back into myself. And it's, you know, it's not overlooking those small things, even if it's 10 minutes to do a quick walk around the block and ground myself in nature and take some deep breaths. Something is always better than nothing. But I started realizing that these things are acts of love towards my children. Because they literally, I remember saying to my therapist once on in one of the, uh, in the pandemic, I said, it's like my parenting depends on me going for a walk. And she said, yeah, Anna, because it does. And it was like, wow. And I started seeing these things that historically for me had been so ridden with guilt and, you know, oh, I feel bad doing this. And, you know, just it really, I started, it was like I just took these hazy old glasses off and started seeing these things for what they were. And a shower that I used to brand as self-care where, hey, I've ticked the self-care box. I had a shower. My husband doesn't come out the shower and go, where, hey, I've ticked the self-care box or I've had a glass of water. Where, hey, go me. I had to start upping my my level of what that actually meant for me. You know, what's ref- what's going to refill and refuel me? It doesn't matter as much to what it is, but but what it gives me. It doesn't need to look like it does for your mate or someone else on the internet. It's what gives what gives you something. And as for the kids, they know that I do these things. And I say, no, mommy's going to go and do her workout now. Here you go. You watch this for a little bit. And they can come see me if they need anything. But they've just, as I've implemented it more into my life, it's just become more normal for them. Mm-hmm. They know, they understand, they might not always like it, but they benefit. They might not like it sometimes, but they benefit. And that, 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 that is far more important. I can deal with their momentary dislike when I know what I'm giving them as a result. I, I love that. And you know, I think it's, it's Glennon Doyle who talks about, you know, our kids learn what love is and our kids will learn what parenthood is from us. And they'll repeat that, right? So the message you want to give your kids around what does it mean? What is a mother, right? How does a mother love? In what ways to herself, to her kids? They really benefit from having a mom who says, I'm going to take a swim. Yes, that is important, right? And I'm going to exercise because it's for myself. You know, for me, one of the things I think about here is how important it is for me to go out with girlfriends or for me to go out with my husband and another couple without kids, right? And how important it is to maintain those other parts of me, part of friend, part of colleague, part wife, right? All the parts of me that are not mom, right? That being a mom is a part of me. I would say it's an important part of me, but I really mean this. It's still a part of me. It's a part of me. And if I don't attend to those other parts, the whole system breaks down because I am not meant to turn into one of my parts. Nothing works well. And so I think about, you know, the times that I carve out, you know, a dinner with a girlfriend and then I can't put my kids to bed or me and my husband both go out, right? And I do think there's something about really owning this to our kids that's so important because I think when they hear our hesitation – you know, we're almost when we ask for permission, you have soccer with your friends. You know, I have to go out with my friends like, whoa, of course they protest more because what they really hear is my mom isn't so sure it's safe to go out with her friends. She is asking me like a five year old <laughs> essentially for permission. That doesn't feel good for anyone because it's just a reversal of roles. And it feels so good, really, to say to my kids in such a straightforward way, I love being your mom. And I love being dad's wife. And part of being a wife is actually spending time 
with your husband without your kids here. That's really important. That's why we go to dinner on Thursday nights with no kids. And it's so liberating to hear myself say that. I actually think it's so comforting for a kid to hear that in such a straightforward way. And so I think what I say to myself before that to motivate that is some version of there are so many parts of me and all of them are worthy of attention, right? Motherhood is a part of me and that's only one part. And that allows me to own it. And then when my kids still do, because of course they do, they're independent people, say, no, but I want you to put me to bed. I can empathize. Oh, you wish mommy could stay tonight. I know you never like when a babysitter puts you to bed. I get that. It's going to be one of the harder nights and I know you can get through it. I actually can empathize with my kid because I don't see their protest as a sign I'm doing something wrong because I've already convinced myself of the importance of this decision. Powerful stuff. And then when you acknowledge all those different parts of yourself, instead of just living the one and deciding that that is the okay one and all the other ones have to, all the other parts have to live in the shadows and then resentment comes in. Yeah. Like, fuck that. Is that okay? Like, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can say that. Yeah. Yeah, I I said it. Because the kids will feel that. Yeah. You know, and what is it? Is it young that says how, you know, one of the biggest gifts essentially we can give our children is is the lived life Mm. of a mother. Oh. A lived life. They are watching us not be self selfless, not being selfish, but being self to show them that they can grow up and be self too. When they grow up, they don't have to stop seeing their friends. They don't have to stop being able to sit and chill on the sofa. They don't have to stop having fun. They can carry on being their self too. First of all, you and I could talk forever and I know there'll be another <laughs> opportunity or I hope there will. The way I love to end podcasts is to give listeners three takeaways. So, so many important things, but we all know me and you too, right? We're moms and multiple kids. Sometimes you're like, just tell me the things. Like I, it's too much, too many things in my head. So I'm going to ask you to take number one and three and I'll jump in with number two. Okay. So if listeners are taking away three things mm-hmm. from this conversation, what would those three things be? Feeling need, feeling need, asking yourself, set it as a reminder on your phone, write it on the back of your hand, FN, what do I feel? What do I need? Don't need to act on it now. You don't even need to understand why. Just acknowledge it and and vocalize it to yourself. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take number two. Ask yourself right now, what part of me can I identify that's important beyond my role as a parent? And it doesn't have to be a friend or a wife. It can be a dancer. It can be a baker. Even though you've never been a professional baker, you just like to bake. What other part of me can I identify beyond my role as a parent? And can I give that part a little bit more attention and time this week? Brilliant. I'm going to think about that one as well. So my third one would be, see when you feel guilt, See, it is it's there, its purpose is to prompt you to think about a need that might have been overlooked. It is not there to shame you. What might it be prompting you to do? Love that. Now, can you tell everyone how they can get more of you? Because I know everyone, like me, will want to follow up. So I'm on the gram, Instagram at Anna Martha, A-N-A-M-A-T-H-U-R. I've got books. I've got one called Mind Over Mother about worrying anxiety and motherhood. I've got one called Know Your Worth, which is about self-esteem, boundaries, people pleasing. And then one recent one called The Little Book of Calm for new mums, which really everyone says is relevant, regardless of how old your kids are. But it's just a little book of emotions and you just skip to the emotion that you feel. You don't read it front to the back and you just get a little kind of pep talks and words of encouragement, some ways of untangling that feeling. And yeah, I've got a podcast called The Therapy Edit, which is all little 10, 20 minute long ramblings like this and chats with guests. I love how well you understand a parent's experience, even that like this book is not (laughs) meant to be read front to back. I hope everyone here heard that because that's a book I really want, right? The book that you're like, this is meant to read in like two minute chunks, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's where my mind is at the moment. Well, thank you so much for being here. I love this conversation that happened as we came together and can't wait for our next opportunity to connect. I loved it too. Thank you for the privilege. Thanks for listening to Good Inside. I love co-creating episodes with you based on the real life tricky situations in your family. 
to share what's happening in your home. You can call 646-598-2543 or email a voice note to goodinsidepodcast at gmail.com. There are so many more strategies and tips I want to share with you and so many good inside parents I want you to meet. I'm beyond excited that we now have a way to connect and learn together. Head to goodinside.com to learn more about Good Inside membership. I promise you, you're going to love it. It's totally game-changing. And if you're not already receiving my free weekly email, go to goodinside.com to sign up. You don't want to miss it. Good Inside with Dr. Becky is produced by Mary Kelly. Our senior producer is Beth Rowe, and our executive producers are Erica Belsky and me. If you enjoyed this episode, please do take a moment to rate and review it or share this episode with a friend or family member as a way to start an important conversation. Let's end by placing our hands on our hearts and reminding ourselves, even as I struggle and even as I have a hard time on the outside, I remain good inside. Why is it so hard to find reliable answers to parenting questions? How is it in 2022, parents still search on Google for answers from strangers? Well, now there's a better way. Introducing the Good Inside Membership, an expert-guided, community-powered platform redefining modern parenting. In our library, you'll find hundreds of bite-sized videos, articles, scripts, and workshops tackling the trickiest parenting topics. And it doesn't stop here. We've created a private community guided by me, Dr. Becky, and coaches trained in the Good Inside Parenting Method. Here you can ask questions, connect with other parents, or attend a live event on a topic that matters to you. This is the parenting handbook that doesn't exist. This is parenting advice at your fingertips, where you need it, when you need it the most. This is Good Inside Membership.